In ancient Italy, centuries before the glory of Rome, there was Etruria and its unique people. The secrets of their world lie buried in the hidden cities of the Etruscans. When I was a student, uh, there was a camp, the strongest camp, was that they came, ready-made Etruscans from, from the near Middle East, possibly from the area of central uh, western Turkey. Around 900 BC, when they began to appear in northern Italy, eventually settling between the Arno River on the north and the Tiber River in the south. Etruria consisted of 12 city-states which lasted about 500 years. Scholars have long argued the subject of Etruscan origins. Did they evolve from farmers who were already there? Or could they have come from the north? Or did they migrate in ships from a far off land, as purported by the fifth century BC Greek historian Herodotus? The Etruscans won a reputation for themselves in antiquity as being a uniquely religious people. In their exuberance for life, they embraced the concept that all of their actions were tied to some higher calling. To them, man's supreme responsibility was to understand and live within the prescribed laws of the cosmos. And just as they accepted the cycles of nature, they also believed the lifespan of men as well as that of their own civilization was preordained. Prophetically, they knew they wouldn't last. Tied in with their belief that the gods controlled destiny, the Etruscans were deeply involved with the art of prophecy. In the tomb of the augurs, we actually see the Etruscan priests with the gesture of the hand brought to the head and looking upwards very likely they are looking to the flight of birds in order prophecy was the aspect of etruscan religion that was most readily integrated into roman mysticism it is due to the romans adopting this ritual that knowledge of it has come down to us in fact it was a roman priest trained by the etruscans who forewarned caesar about the ides of march and yet caesar could do nothing as his fate had been sealed. They were also known as a people with a taste for violence and barbarity. It is believed these stone channels carried blood during the high priest's rituals of human sacrifice. Why did they do this? Scholars may only guess. In the 6th century BC, it was culturally sophisticated and economically and politically powerful. The city of Tarquinia was the crown jewel of Etruria. And if you had come here in the 6th century BC, you would have found not only a very prosperous and thriving city, but also one whose families were involved in ruling, at that time, a small settlement on the banks of the river Tiber called Rome. They were the ones who put the first temples there, paved the forum, and created what we might call the basis of Rome as a city. The Etruscans also had wine almost as early as the Greeks. It's very hard to pin down the... We're told by Greek writers who uh, were fond of being shocked by the Etruscans that uh, they played music to um, just about all of their daily activities. Um, for example, when they were kneading bread, they had the pipes going. Uh, when they were spanking their slaves, they uh, played this to the music of the pipes. And... The slaves ranged from the musicians and dancers, whom we see depicted in the tomb paintings, to the cooks and servers and the anonymous multitudes. Needless to say, members of this class were not buried in the tombs, only their pictures. In some of the tombs, like this one in the Etruscan city of Tarquinia, Walls were painted with scenes from the occupants' lives, as well as depictions of religious beliefs. Like many other Mediterranean peoples of antiquity, 
Death to the Etruscans was a pleasant con Etruscans must have been entertained by the depiction of sexuality, as exemplified by two paintings. Archaic innocence, accepting life, knowing all about it, and feeling the meaning, a symbolic meaning, quite distinct from a moral meaning. Some actions the man-faced bull accepts calmly. Against other actions, he charges with lowered horns. It is not judgment. It is the sway of passionate action and reaction of the father of milk. The span of the sixth century BC represented both the height and the beginning of the decline of Etruria. The world of the Etruscans, with its splendid royal and aristocratic life, began to crumble by the end of the sixth century. Roman historians paint a picture of Etruria in this period that is quite bleak. The undoing of the Etruscans, they said, was due to a lack of morality, exemplified by the rape of Lucretia. The Romans told this as a kind of admonition tale, and, uh, a warning of going too far in the pursuit of sexual excess. The Romans were outraged. According to their historians, they unanimously agreed to expel the Tarquin dynasty and thus ended Etruscan family rule of Rome. As a result, the Etruscans lost crucial control of the Tiber River and were blocked from trading with southern Italy. They scrambled to hold onto their other trade routes, so crucial to their economic survival. The Etruscans strengthened their naval power through an alliance with Carthage against the Greeks, who at that time held the island of Syracuse, or what is known today as Sicily. But this tactic was in vain. The Etruscans suffered death and destruction in a disastrous naval defeat at the hands of the Greeks. For the Grecian warriors, it was sweet revenge. After years of humiliation on the high seas at the hands of Etruscan pirates, the Greeks had gotten even. In the year 396 BC, Baiae, the Etruscan city closest to Rome, was taken after a 10-year siege as Roman legions marched into the city. Their independence was their undoing. The League of Twelve City-States should have banded together to stem the rising tide of Roman advances. But the members fell to bickering with one another and thus never formed the kind of alliance necessary to hold the Romans back. One by one, the Etruscan cities came under Roman control. Rome conquered Tarquinia, the jewel of Etruria, in 351 BC, and then Cerveteri in 343 BC. The aristocracy's indecent reliance on a large slave population ultimately undermined them. When the slaves finally revolted, the city-states were weakened by all the civil unrest. The Romans acted on a critical opportunity. With the absorption of the Etruscans into the Roman culture, their religion, customs, and language fell into disuse. They became Romanized and took on the more acceptable mode of communication, Latin. As the centuries passed, the Etruscans all but disappeared, but their legacy is not to be minimized. Brief inscriptions surviving the centuries offer a few insights. Though written in an alphabet mostly borrowed from the Greeks, the language itself has yet to be decoded. Their Buchero pottery, black with embossed details, has also defied duplication. In the of the games, wealthy Etruscans enjoyed competition only as spectators. That's because the games were usually played to the death, ironically as entertainment at funerals. The Roman historical tradition tells us that it was from these funeral games of the Etruscans that the Roman tradition of circuses and gladiators grew up. 
So for those who love their Etruscans, usually find this a negative sign to their civilization, that blood was spilled on the occasion of a funeral, with boxing or with games in which someone is set upon by dogs. Herman a victor. Others were quite strange.